So here's a bit of a story about a potential um, oil play that might be working in the northern Levant Basin. So how does this affect Koresh or uh, Zor? And conversely, how does Zor affect this story? So from what we understand at the moment, um, the Zor feature here is uh, an early Miocene reef. So it's grown at the same time as the sands, the turbidite sands that do, um, form the reservoir in Tamar and form the reservoir in the northern Levant Basin uh, coming into the basin. It's an early Miocene reef and we understand that the gas is a very dry gas. Now, nobody's said that it's a biogenic gas, but the odds are it's the same biogenic gas as you get in um, Tamar and so forth. So it says something about the deposition rate and the substance rate and the, the geotherm around the uh, Eratosthenes seamount. So it's, it's a gas story and it doesn't uh, corroborate a, an oil story and I want to be very clear about that. When the, the discovery was made, um, of course, because we've got seismic data, well, it's a little bit of an advert, but I mean, Spectrum itself has got three million kilometers of 2D data all over the world. So when anything happens, we go and have a scurry through the data and see what we can uh, see for that, uh, that discovery. And in this area, we have quite a lot of data, uh, predominantly to the north of Zor. Um, so the first thing we wanted to do is see if we could see Zor. And we can, we can see Zor now, although I have to confess I couldn't see it beforehand. <laughs> and it helps when it color, it's colored in. Um, but but we, can, we can see it now. Um, and then, of course, having got our eye in, so, okay, so this fuzzy, fuzzy sort of imaging is not just, you know, poor seismic imaging. It's actually the reef part. Uh, in, in the middle, you get a bit more coherence, so that's probably a lagoonal facies, and then you get some more fuzzy uh, reflectivity. So, you know, it, it, having got your eye in and suggesting, well, that's probably not... Um, just seismic imaging it might be something else. We weren't looking around for um, other features like this. So this feature, Zor features 100 square kilometers. So we went looking around. It didn't take us very long to spot this feature, uh, which has got fuzzy reflectivity on either side and then rather coherent uh, reflectivity in the middle. So um, when I put that on it, you get a sort of Zor lookalike feature. Um, and this one is not an itty-bitty, almost can't see it, 100 square kilometres. This is a 500 square kilometre uh, carbonate reef. And it's just sitting again on the uh, Eratosthenes uh, seamount, on, on the edges of it, and covered by Mycenaean salt. And these are probably the key play elements um, that we need to think about as we go look for these features. Uh, here's another example, um, just a little bit further along. Again, you could... I think we've always seen this big nobble sticking there, but we never actually knew what it was. Um, so now I think we've got an idea that these are uh, early Miocene carbonate buildups. And presumably they all have some prospectivity rather similar to Zor. So if th those were predominantly north-south uh, lines. This is an east-west or west-east line going over the Eratosthenes Seamount, uh, which is this guy in here. And this is the northern Levant Basin, so you can see uh, Leviathan and Aphrodite with the early Miocene reservoirs in here, and then these big, big carbonate buildups, which actually sit on both sides of the Eratosthenes uh, uh, Seamount. Um, the Eratosthenes Seamount itself, just uh, if you can just bear me a slight digression, it's really, really cool because uh, even though now it's in like 1,500 metres of water, uh, just shy of 1,500 metres of water. Um, at the time of the Mycenaean, uh, they were depositing paleosols there. So the Eratosthenes Seamount was exposed at the time of the Mycenaean salinity crisis. So it strikes me you do this two ways. One is that you either pull all the water out of the Mediterranean, which I like, but not everybody likes, so that you completely desiccate the, the Mediterranean. And the other way to do it is to very rapidly, since uh, over the last six million years, you very rapidly... Um, subside that whole uh, seamount and it, you know probably due to the fact that it's, it's being pushed under um, Cyprus at some point and that, that sort of tectonic forcing of this substance but the interesting thing is that this exposure may relate to the carbonate um, buildups that are all around the Eratosthenes seamount 
and presumably they were exposed, maybe they uh, developed um, a karstic porosity at that time, and maybe that's why these uh, carbonate build-ups are going to work. And I'm sure in the audience today, uh, you know, we've all drilled carbonate build-ups which uh, didn't work for one reason. Well, okay, I've done it, but I don't know if everybody's done it. Um, but, uh, and this may be one of the things that will make this play repeatable, and I think that's going to be important, uh, as was mentioned by uh, Stephen. Uh, it's just one well in one carbonate bank. Um, we have to make this repeatable to add the significant reserves. The Aerososceles Seamount, which is located here, is supposed to sit on uh, attenuated um, continental crust, and that the oceanic crust is, is basically to the, to the west and, and generates the Herodotus Basin and so forth. That's the conventional model. I don't know if we actually really know any of that. I don't know if we actually know what the Aristosthenes Seamount is made of. It may be just a bit of folded oceanic crust for all I know. All I know is it's sticking up in the early Miocene and we were growing reefs around it and that's probably all we need to know at this stage. So if we take another line here um, that runs around the seamount, you, you can see numerous of the Zorettes uh, just sort of growing, up, growing around there. So there's huge potential in that area to the north. My understanding is that there are more of these carbonate buildups offshore uh, Egypt, not all of them in the ENI um, acreage as well. So I think that this part of the world has huge potential that will roll on from Zor because of this route of... Uh, re repeatability developer than Tamar. So we go to the northern Levant, um, ask three questions again. Is it just a biogenic gas play in the northern Levant basin? No. It's probably an oil play as well. Um, does offshore Israel have the thickest, <clears throat> best quality reservoirs in the Levant basin? No. Go to the northern Levant basin, you'll find them uh, three or four times as thick. And are the best structures in South Lebanon? No, the simpler structures are in Northern Levant Basin. So then, last slide. Yay! Yay. Um, there you go. As An Andy Warhol has showed, you can rush art. Um, so, last slide. Um, this is what we found to date. Something like 100 TCF in the Nile Delta, whether it be in the Pliocene, in the Miocene, in these super deep um, wells that are being drilled, or, or the Abermadi. So something like 100 TCF there, and something like 50 TCF off, offshore Israel. Following Zor, there's got to be 50 TCF in the Zor analogues that um, wrap around the Eratosthenes Seamount. And on our evaluation in Northern Levant Basin, there's probably another 50 TCF at all. And if you just go by closeology alone, you can see that there's some potential truth in this. And this shows you what will keep coming out of the Eastern Mediterranean. And I would heartily encourage you all to um, explore it if you can. Thank you. Thank you.